Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cast Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 916 for January 16th, 2022. Coming up in a few minutes. I took a piece of paper. I thought Ruth might be interested in this. And so we were chatting away, and I had my sort of, as I say, photocopy of a photocopy in my. Um, briefcase and was, you know, sort of thinking I was absolutely, uh, you know, sort of the bee's knees for being able to have a copy of this. And we were having this conversation and she suddenly pulled a copy of the entire book out of her desk drawer in Japanese and I just about fell over. A century ago, the Japanese distiller Masataka Takatsuru was taking the lessons he learned from his studies in Scotland and developing what would become Japan's domestic whiskey industry. His guide was the notebook he kept while doing what we'd call today an internship at Hazelburn Distillery in Campbellton, Scotland, working under distillery manager Peter Innes. Innes's grandson is Alan Wollstenholm, who's been in the whiskey industry for the last 50 years and is a professor now at Harriet Watt University. He and translator Ruth Ann Hurd have produced the first-ever English-language translation of Takatsuru's notebook. On the production methods of pot still whiskey is now available for a new generation of distillers and whiskey lovers. Alan Wollstenholm joins me later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. We'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, behind the label, and... And the Canadian Whiskey of the Year, Best Whiskey of the Year, it was not close this year. They won by a mile. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. Well, the holidays have come and gone, and hopefully you had enough good whiskey to share with friends and family. If your whiskey shelf is looking a little thin, look no further than Dewar's Double Double 21 Year to add to the New Year's collection. Double-aged and finished in the finest Oloroso sherry casks, this one may not last. Find it at a store near you. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Robin Redbreast? You may have seen me around. Face label, label face, yeah. That's the one. I'm now contractually obligated to be their spokesbird. <laughs> yeah, my agent didn't read the small print. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by the Dalmore. Bureaucracy usually takes longer than expected to produce results. And we're seeing an example of that right now in the U.S. You may recall that several months ago, we reported that the Treasury Department's Tax and Trade Bureau was planning to release a proposed rule that defines American single malt whiskey for the first time. The federal government's regulatory calendar indicated that that was supposed to be done in December, starting a 90-day public comment period. Well, December has come and gone, and the proposal is still in TTB limbo. There's no word on when it might come, but it could be published in the Federal Register as soon as this week. We are tracking that story, and we'll have the details when it's released. We also mentioned a couple of weeks ago that there might be some progress on ending the UK's tariff on imports of American whiskies as early as this week. That was when Britain's International Trade Secretary, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, had invited U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo to meet in London. The U.K. wants the U.S. to drop its tariffs on imports of British steel and aluminum in a parallel move to the deal reached last October with the European Union. However, this week, Raimondo rejected the invitation, According to a Commerce Department spokesman, she is not in a position to travel to London in person at this time. There was no discussion of meeting virtually. Meanwhile, Trevelyan is out on the road this week. She is in India for the start of talks aimed at hammering out a new free trade agreement between the UK and India. Of course, part of that debate will include India's heavy tariffs, on imports of scotch whiskey and other imported drinks. 
We'll get the latest look at the bourbon industry's economic impact in Kentucky this week. A news conference is set for Wednesday at the state capitol in Frankfurt to release the latest in a series of reports from University of Louisville economists on the overall economic impact created by distillers. That includes everything from jobs and payroll to tourism. We'll have the highlights from that briefing next time around. In other news... Canadian Whiskey of the Year is Crown Royal Noble Collection Winter Wheat. The best blended whiskey of the year, Crown Royal Noble Collection Winter Wheat. The blender of the year, Diageo Blending Lab in Montreal. The distillery of the year this year, Diageo Global Supply in Gimli. That's Canadian Whiskey Awards founder Davin de Kergamo announcing Crown Royal's sweep of the major awards in this year's competition Thursday night. While many of the individual categories were close, Crown Royal's Noble Collection Winter Wheat was the overall top-scoring whiskey among the nine judges in blind tasting. And as Davin told us on the Happy Hour live webcast Friday night, it reflects a trend back toward the bolder Canadian whiskies of the past. We're going back to the old days of Canadian whiskey when it had you know big, robust whiskies like that you know Canadian masterpiece I had from the seventies that I was waving around a couple of weeks ago. And we're also getting much more of, of the elegance of of Canadian whiskey in there, much more of that elegant uh, base whiskey in there, and and they're going towards that. And what we're seeing is that <clears throat> these whiskeys, they, they, a shock and awe whiskey doesn't do it as it might have done a few years ago. It now has to have that elegance, that complexity. It has to be a synthesis of many things. So it's, uh, it really is uh, changing. So, so people, people's tastes are changing. But you're absolutely right. The quality is uh, going, heading in the right direction. It's heading up. You can watch my entire conversation with Davin and whiskey writer Billy Abbott at the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, or listen for the podcast version later this week. By the way, Diageo's master blender for Crown Royal, Joanne Scandella, was the winner of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award as well. Other big winners to note, Shelter Point Distillery took top honors for Best Canadian Single Malt, along with the best all-rye whiskey, best single-barrel whiskey, and best cask-strength whiskey. Okanagan Spirits in British Columbia was named the Artisanal Distiller of the Year, while Forty Creek Masters Cut won the Award of Excellence for Innovation. We have a link to the complete list of winners in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. I'll share my tasting notes for the Canadian Whiskey of the Year in a few minutes. Seattle's Westland Distillery is ending an era with its latest Peat Week release. The Peat Week Grand Finale will come out on January 28th. It's a seven-year-old American single malt with just 221 bottles to be made available. It's being called the Grand Finale because after eight years... Westland's peat weak whiskies distilled from peated Scottish barley are being phased out. They'll be replaced next year by Solum, which is being distilled from barley smoked with locally sourced peat from Washington's Olympic Peninsula. Finally, imagine trying to putt a golf ball the length of a basketball court, with the hardwood making even the greens at St. Andrews seem friendly. All right, Kevin, go ahead. Take your first cut. He's already on the way. Pretty good speed. Get in there. That was very Wednesday night, Kevin Birch nailed that 96-foot putt during the halftime of the Louisville-North Carolina State game at the KFC Yum Center in Liquor Barn's Putt for Pappy contest. He walked away with a bottle of 23-year-old Pappy Van Winkle bourbon. No word on how much Kevin paid for his tickets to the game. 
but they're probably not even close to the price of a bottle of Pappy on the secondary market. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by the Dalmore. Hello, Richard Patterson here, master distiller, master blender for the Dalmore. You know, whenever the team and I are in the world sharing our exceptional single malt, we like to keep in touch with Mark Gillespie and the latest news from Whiskey Cast. Join us this Friday at 5 p.m. New York time, 2200 GMT, for this week's Happy Hour Live webcast. You can watch the fun on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events, brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. As of now, the Southport Winter Whiskey Festival, February 11th and 12th, in Southport, England, is still on, along with Glasgow's Whiskey Festival at Hampton Park on February 19th, and the Newcastle Whiskey Festival, February 26th. Distill America is set for March 5th in Madison, Wisconsin. The Roma Whiskey Festival is March 5th and 6th in Rome, Italy. Whiskey and Barrel Night New York is March 10th, and Whiskey Live Dublin is on the 11th and 12th in the Irish capital. Keep in mind all in-person events are still subject to change on short notice, and you may have to show proof of vaccination or a recent negative COVID test or both in order to attend. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. Catoctin Creek co-founder Scott Harris is leading his annual Art of the Cocktail class again this winter. The fun happens each Friday night online. Get all the details at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com. Catoctin Creek reminds you to always drink responsibly. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. So, in Spain, they call Redbreast Petit Rocco. It's me, but a touch more exotic. Kind of like a Redbreast PX edition. Finished in Pedro Jimenez casks, adding a velvety and decadent dimension. You know, I won't lie. A climate like this makes me wish I was a migratory bird. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Oban and the Classic Malts lineup. Masataka Takatsuru is regarded as the father of Japanese whiskey. He took what he learned in Scotland a century ago back to Japan to make whiskey, first for the company that we know today as Suntory, and a decade later at his own Nika Whiskey Yoichi Distillery. But until now, his 1973 memoir Whiskey and Myself was the only time he told his own story of that time in Scotland. The extensive notebook he kept back then has now been translated into English for the first time. It's called, in English, On the Production Methods of Pot Still Whiskey. Expert translator Ruth Ann Hurd did the translation, while Harriet Watt University professor Alan Wollstenholm did the technical editing, and there's a story behind his role. His grandfather, Peter Innes, was the distillery manager at Hazelburn Distillery in Campbellton and Takatsuru's tutor a century ago. Alan and I talked on Zoom this week. Why did it take so long to translate uh, the notebook? Personally, myself and Ruth, it took us over, over a year. The reason why it took so long to get to this point was quite simply that um, it was within the possession of, firstly, um, uh, a historic Japanese whiskey company, and then latterly, Nika. And there does seem to have been some um, uh, hesitation about actually um, getting a a translation out. Uh, The only reason that this one appeared is because of the the uh, fact that uh, a small run was done in Japanese for Japanese whiskey enthusiasts. And by a most remarkable coincidence, 
uh, a Japanese native um, uh, sent a copy to Ruth Hurd because she was a native of Campbellton and she thought she might be interested. And Ruth thought she was interested, right? Yes. Well, the <laughs> two of us um, came together uh, about th uh, three or four years ago um, via a shared interest in things historic, um, whiskey oriented. Uh, it, it was it was actually on a Facebook site called um, Alfred Bernard's uh, Facebook site, which is a bunch of nerdy guys talking about history um, uh, uh, to do with the uh, the whiskey industry, you'll find guys like Alan Winchester on it and, and that sort of thing. Um, and she saw that I had posted one or two things relating to Hazelburn and my grandfather, who was the manager there. And uh, she, she reached out and said, oh, it would be good to have a chat. Now, I live in um, south of Scotland and, and she lives in um, London. So it wasn't uh, too easy. But eventually I had a meeting down in London and I diverted from my intended um, schedule to meet up with her at Imperial College and that was the first time we met. Now I had actually come into the possession of a very badly photocopied photocopy of the book which intrigued me greatly because I could see the illustrations but the to say that the Japanese was double Dutch to me is doing it a, a, a grave disservice. It was just hieroglyphics. It didn't mean a simple thing. So I, I, took a, I took a piece of paper. I thought Ruth might be interested in this. And so we were chatting away and I had my sort of, as I say, photocopy of a photocopy in my um, briefcase and was, you know, sort of thinking I was absolutely, uh, you know, sort of the bee's knees for being able to have a copy of this. And we were having this conversation and she suddenly pulled a copy of the entire book out of her desk drawer in Japanese, and I just about fell over. Um, so this was the copy in Japanese that she had been looking at um, or been given by a, a friend because she is um, a very extremely competent scholar in both Japanese and Chinese, having spent time uh, in, in the Far East and, and very, very competent with all the various languages and teaching the same and writing books about the same um, at Imperial College. Now, she was, um, she's involved and is still involved, um, you know, in, in various uh, projects. And this initially wasn't one of them, uh, writing projects. Uh, I said, wouldn't it be really good to know what was said? Because it was just, to me, it was just a whole load of hieroglyphics. Uh, I said, wouldn't, wouldn't it be really good? And she, well, she says, well, I've got other projects and it'd be a bit difficult and might take a bit of time. And I said, yeah, but it really, would be really good to know what it said. And she said, yeah, I know what you mean. I'll maybe start translating it. So she started translating it. And I don't know how much you know about Japanese, uh, probably not much more than I did at the start of this uh, exercise. But one thing I have learned um, from this and other exercises is um, Japanese has no definite or in indefinite articles. Uh, if it, what that means is there's no as and there's. <laughs> so basically when you translate uh, Japanese script, what you get is a whole load of nouns and verbs and that, but you could put them in different <laughs> orders and mean different things. So it's quite challenging. So Ruth started translating some of this Japanese, some of which was archaic and Every so often as she translated a, a, a chapter or whatever, she would share it with me and I would go through and to some extent try to make sense of it from a technical point of view. It, it wasn't just like translating something from Spanish to English where, you know, roughly the word, word order is going to be similar and some of the words are going to be similar. It, it, it was much more challenging. And we had here a book that a Japanese native was uh, writing for his colleagues about something that he'd seen, but they hadn't. So it's, it's much more like a technical manual than anything really to do with um, your average whiskey book. This project would not have happened without Ruth's incredible um, uh, knowledge of, of Chinese and Japanese. Um, it, it's, it was a, a formidable, she made it sound very easy, but she translated this and then, as I say, put it over to me. I would try to make sense of what I thought um, Master Takatatsuru would be trying to say about distilling from my, no my knowledge of distilling today. But naturally, 
I didn't know exactly how distilling was a hundred years ago. So the, there was this sort of there'd be dialogues, uh, and would I'd be saying she'd be saying I think he's saying this, and I'm saying I don't think he'd be saying that. Could he be saying that? And she'd say, well, maybe the word ha- th- this word could have different meanings. And we had um, a, a phenomenal number of discussions um, uh, of that nature, and draftings and redraftings, taking a considerable time. And as time went on, we got more familiar with the way he presented things, um, and also I became more familiar with uh, the Japanese uh, system of measurement, which is, was a challenge in itself, um, it, it began to all fall into place. And, and we would do subsequent iterations of chapters and then the entire, entire book. And then you could see after multiple uh, reruns that there, there was a kind of, it was very consistent. There was, a, you know, you could tell what he was trying to do, try how he, how, how he went about explaining things. And um, ultimately, after multiple uh, reworkings, we got to a stage where we were both happy that it reflected what he had said and that I felt that it could be presented before some of my peers in the whiskey industry without them, you know, sort of uh, falling over and saying this is ridiculous, this couldn't have happened or he would never have said this. You've done this project with the, the support and the blessing of Nico Whiskey and is it fair to say that uh, they re- sort of did they get a chance to look at the translated manuscript, uh, their native Japanese speakers who also speak English, and to sort of do a comparison between the two to see if you got it right? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, the, you know, the, the um, there were four parties in this project: uh, Ruth, uh, primarily uh, myself, supporting her. Uh, Stuart Johnson, the publisher, who did a, a remarkably good job, and Nika. Now, we were well down the road, and it, it was going to happen in one form or another um, before Ruth approached Nika and uh, sort of, you know, out of courtesy, said, would you like to see what it is that we are going to publish? Now, th- they they could have said, no, we don't want to see it, but they didn't. They joined in, and they at the end, they made one or two um, very uh, critical things which have improved the publication enormously. One was they did run it through, I think they ran it through a sort of com- um, a computer program first uh, to check the translation or whatever, which, which Ruth, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of thought could, could at times be quirky. But they also did have their own technical people uh, who understood both Japanese, English and distilling. And they, they, they made one or two very minor um, suggestions, which we were happy to incorporate, uh, but generally they didn't ask for any many changes. The major thing they did, which, um, you know, I will be eternally grateful to them, was the reprint of the book, initial book that Ruth had, didn't contain the illustrations. And Nika gave us permission to incorporate the illustrations. And although it'd still be interesting, without the illustrations. Coupled with the illustrations, it makes, I find it still a really fascinating document. Uh, some some of the illustrations, indeed, I'm not sure if they were even uh, Masataka Takazuru's own. I think some of them he had probably drawn heavily um, on Nettleton, if you, if you know the Nettleton work, uh, the famous work there. Um, so some of them may have been derived himself from another work. But nevertheless, to have the drawings as Masataka Takatsuru had them within his own notes for his return to, at that time, obviously it was, it was Setsu Hyusho, um, the company that sent him to Scotland. Um, as I say, it wouldn't be half the thing, uh, it wouldn't be half the um, impact without the illustrations, which uh, Nika thankfully um, uh, uh, allowed us to use. And history will tell us and remind us that uh, Nika was not around at this point. Uh, He was working for the Tory family of uh, a certain uh, Japanese brand that uh, you have not mentioned, but I'll say it, Suntory. And then after he had his uh, falling out with the Tory family, he went off to found Nika Whiskey about 10 years later after this, just to keep the historical record straight here. Otherwise, 
I'll get emails from listeners going, how could you have forgotten to mention that part? So, Well, I, th- I, th- I think it's pretty interesting that the people who sent them over uh, were neither of those two companies, but it was Setsu Shusho. Um, and for whatever reason, when he returned from Scotland, they had lost interest, and there's various theories, they had lost interest in making whiskey. And both he and his Scottish wife, Rita, that he had um, uh, married along the journey, and uh, when they went back to Japan, both of them took up uh, teaching at uh, Osaka, St. Andrew's College, uh, Osaka. And it was at Kotobukaya, as the earlier name for Suntory was. And um, I, I've got to get this right, Shinjiro Tori, who uh, sought him out, who had been expecting to have to lure over a Scottish distiller, um, but found out that there was one close at hand, uh, a person who had a lot of knowledge, and that... Um, he signed him up to a 10-year contract in order to uh, basically, you know, uh, design, build, commission and run um, uh, uh, Yamazaki Distillery. Let's talk about Hazelburn now, because you have, as you've alluded to, a very special connection to uh, where Takatsuru did his research. Uh, let's go into detail and explain how this connection worked. Well, it's fair to say that without this um, connection, I, 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 I probably wouldn't have developed such a strong interest in this in the entire story. Um, but the, the 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 key thing is that at the time that uh, Masataka Takatsuru did his, as he called it, apprenticeship at uh, Hazelburn Distillery, which took place for about five months, we think, between January and. Um, April, May of uh, 1920, so just over 100 years ago, uh, my, my maternal grandfather was the distillery manager at that time. Uh, he does indeed get name-checked in, in, the, in the book br- briefly, uh, referred to as the, with a curious um, uh, sort of description of chief technician, which I, I think was Masataka Takatsuru trying to make him sound maybe a little bit more authoritative than your run-of-the-mill um, distillery manager of the time. And uh, so the, the fact was my, my grandfather was there. I must admit I'd hoped when the translation of the notebooks was coming out that there might have been more sort of information and dialogue, you know, like he said and he said and he told me, but, I, you know, there, but there wasn't anything much like that. But I, I, I can sense within some of the comments that... Uh, um, uh, Basataka Takatsuru made that he didn't um, he didn't figure this the, some things out himself in the course of five months <laughs> when we're talking about uh, you know how whiskey develops on maturation and things like that. He, he so he had already uh, he'd attended one or two classes at university. He'd formed um, a kind of uh, um, sort of a strong relationship with one of his uh, professors, Professor Wilson, not at Glasgow University, but actually at what is now Strathclyde University, and um, uh, was then uh, called um, the Royal Tech or something like that in Glasgow. And this guy seems to have taken him under his wing, Professor Wilson, and got him into um, Bones Grain Distillery, Gartloch Grain Distillery, but Masataka Taksuru, he had visited Longmorn briefly, and he was very clear that he wanted to learn more in detail about malt distilling. Although he hadn't uh, managed to um, form a relationship with the uh, famous authority Nettleton when he visited him in, in Elgin, he did get a copy of his uh, fantastic book, which... Uh, <laughs> I, don't know if you've, I don't know if you've got one. I've, I've, got, a, I've got a reprint here. Um, it's 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 really fantastic book. Um, I do not, but I need to get my hands on a copy. Uh, well, it was done by Ian Buxton uh, a few years back, a reprint, and I asked him only uh, a month or so ago, um, "Do you have any of those left?" Because I thought there might be a run on them, and he said, "No, they're long gone, <laughs> but they will be out there somewhere." And along with Bernard, it's the thing you really want on your bookshelf. Definitely. So uh, Masataka Takatsuru had spent a lot of time translating the relevant bits of Nettleton to aid his study of, of malt whiskey. He also wanted to learn about blending. He'd, he'd identified White Horse as being one of the um, two or three prominent whiskey companies in Glasgow. And I think he was trying very hard to get in there to figure out what this blending lark was about. 
Now, White Horse was owned and run by a gent uh, called Sir Peter Mackey, um, a very a, um, a character. Uh, now, the industry doesn't have so many characters nowadays, but back in the day, um, when you heard somebody was a character, you you, you knew to watch out. <laughs> anyway, so he was a, he was a bit of a character um, promoting White Horse. He didn't like the idea, it would appear, that again, we don't have documentary evidence for everything, but it would appear that he didn't want this gentleman in the blending, possibly because sensitive ratios of molten grain, all that sort of stuff. Um, we're only talking about, you know, a year, a, a decade after Islington and the Royal Commission and all that sort of stuff. And he had acquired, during 1919, he'd acquired Hazelburn. He headhunted my grandfather, who at that time had, was working at Yoker uh, Distillery in Glasgow, um, having learnt his trade at Tam Du up in Nakando, um, and said uh, to him in a brewer role, which is the kind of second in command, how would you like to be a manager? Uh, a line which has been used many times in the industry and usually meets with an affirmative. And so my grandfather and his wife and at that time two children um, jumped on a paddle steamer from the Broomy Law in Glasgow and headed off down to Campbellton on the far, the far end of the Firth of Clyde and took over very end of basically about October 1919 and took over uh, Hazelburn with the mission to improve it because Campbellton whiskey had somewhat fallen in favour. Uh, people had thought the quality had drifted and it was no longer as desirable in the, in the blend. But I think Peter Mackey couldn't resist a bargain. And I think he saw that in Hazelburn that potentially um, a distillery that could be improved and used in the White Horse. He already obviously had um, uh, good supplies of whiskey coming from um, Lagavulin, uh, which was a, a Mackey enterprise and Kregelichy. So, but So anyway, within about three or four months of arriving there, suddenly... Um, Peter uh, Innes is asked to look after this Japanese uh, gentleman. Now, there's no um, absolute written evidence that I have. If anybody has it, it's probably Nick Morgan and the, and the Diageo archives. Um, but he wasn't allowed into blending, but he suddenly ends up in this distillery you know, quite far away. <laughs> and I, I think there may have been an element of um, let's get him out of where he might uh, potentially be an embarrassment and put him away to the ends of the earth. I, I don't, hope guys in Campbellton won't, won't get too upset uh, by me describing it like that, but it is quite difficult to get to, and that would be a safer place for him to spend a bit of time um, without picking up anything too important, because after all, Campbellton, you know, wasn't making that great whiskey at the time. Anyway, I, 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 you've got, you can fill in the blanks. I'd love to debate it with um, anybody else who has opinions. But the facts are, having just married, he turns up in Campbellton, takes digs and um, spends the next four or five months uh, beavering away, uh, you know, being very, very busy uh, in, in, in Hazelburn and being able... Um, and he does refer later on in his autobiography to Peter Innes as his mentor. He gives him a, a, an honorific of Dr. Innes, um, which again sort of shows the, re the respect that he had for him and how highly he regarded him and how much he was able to take what he'd learned from his knowledge of the Japanese in uh, uh, drinks industry, um, uh, things like, you know, uh, soju, soju and other such drinks that Japanese were already making. He'd done a course uh, at Osaka in fermentation and drinks manufacture. He took that over to Scotland. He'd visited one or two distilleries. But now he had four or five months where basically every day he went into the office and was able to watch, listen, learn, walk around the place and uh, dialogue with somebody who was very expert in the field. I have a feeling that Sir Peter Mackey had uh, more than just uh, the potential for embarrassment on his mind, given that the reaction after uh, Takatsu returns to Japan and we start seeing Japanese whiskeys coming out was that uh, one of 
almost being described as a spy for what was the nascent Japanese whiskey industry. And perhaps it was Mackey's decision to keep him out of the blending lab so he didn't learn all the secrets. Yes, well, there's, 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 there's plenty of stuff there for a good um, uh, uh, debate. If he, if he was a spy, he was certainly um, a very open spy, <laughs> because um, although he wasn't the only Japanese student that knocking around Glasgow, um, you know, in the beginning of the, of the 20th century, um, he, he, he would have stood out, um, I think. So there was no... There was no sign of kind of subterfuge. Uh, involved. Oh, I'm not saying he subterfuge. Was, or just he was open he, about it, and they let him was, in the door. He was, and he was he, he was a man with a mission. Now, yeah. this the, the, if you go right back to um, I don't know if you've heard of, of, of the Scottish samurai and and people like that. Um, Scotland and Japan since the opening up of Japan, the black ships, all that sort of stuff. There had been quite an interchange of knowledge, and the. Um, a lot of Japanese students had come over to learn things like shipbuilding. That didn't work out too well either, by the way, or it probably worked out worse. <laughs> uh, in that, uh, <laughs> we don't have a shipbuilding industry to talk of anymore. Um, but th there wasn't an idea that, um, and I think that probably was maybe even a little bit of arrogance that, um, well, it's all down to the water. They can come and see what they like, but they won't be able to replicate it. Uh, so I, I think there was, um, you know, I know that subsequently Stuart Hasty, who both uh, Nick Morgan and I share um, an interest in the, in, the, in the key role he played in, in, in making the industry more scientific, um, I, I know that he was not amused when subsequently uh, Ersatz Scotch whisky appeared towards the end of the 1920s uh, under um, the uh, Kotobukaya, the, the, the um, what became Santori label. And they probably perhaps wished that they'd taken it a little bit more seriously um, and could wind the clock back. But Peter Mackey died in 1925, so they couldn't really do a lot about it. it you know, it's a bit like trying to shut the stable door after the horse is out. The other thing is that, um, and again, this is a, a good one for a bit of a debate, um, that it wasn't entirely a one-way trade. Scotland, this is a bit of a hypothesis, but I, I, I'm willing again to debate it and discuss it. But everybody, everybody, everybody associates um, Scottish distilleries with the pagoda roof. Now, that pagoda roof, um, which is um, um, a more correctly uh, called the Doig ventilator, uh, was put on, I think, as a little bit of a flourish by Charles Doig, the architect in Elgin, who... I think tapped into the uh, enthusiasm with Orientalism towards the end of the 19th century and put this on as a bit of a uh, flourish. And it's become synonymous with Scotch distilleries. But nowadays, some people might regard that as cultural appropriation. <laughs> because Never Dakota, quite thought of it like that, but I can see that point. Yeah. Or it's an architectural um, appropriation. Indeed. Uh, of something that was very associated with the Far East, China and Japan. And uh, so, you know, sort of, it's not a one-way street. And the other thing that, that, that I kind of put out there was that the distilleries in Scotland were somewhat behind the breweries in terms of their scientific approach. And one of the things that Hasty and others since, in, 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 including Nick and whatnot, have talked about was there seemed to be a, a change in the early 1920s and about the scientific approach to distilling. And, and the key person in there was that um, Stuart Hasty was employed also by Sir Peter Mackey and sent to Hazelburn. And by 1922, so basically in 21, I think, had set up a full-blown laboratory in Hazelburn. And he and my grandfather, because this came through the family, conducted enormous amounts of experiments about the science of, of whiskey making. And this was written up, I've got, I've got it in the bookshelf behind as well, um, in the Institute of uh, the, uh, the, um, journal, the Journal of the Institute of Brewing, uh, published in 1925 and a couple of years thereafter in three volumes. Fantastic stuff. How they did that with the wet chemistry of the day, I do not know. But he was comparing Campbellton whiskey, which was Hazelburn, with Isla whiskey, which was Lagavulin, 
with Speyside whiskey, which I'm pretty damn sure was Krigelachy. Um, and he was comparing and contrasting the chemical analysis of these three whiskies in enormous detail um, with the wet chemistry of the day. Um, the sort of um, the sort of equipment you see behind me, the, the balance and, and measuring things and all that sort of stuff. It just, it's where I started in, in a lab 50 years ago. But um, I think Nick uh, in his, um, his most recent work uh, refers to, you know, the sort of any distillery that isn't performing optimally will get hit with the men in white coats. I remember Nick saying that specifically. And the first guy I've seen in a white coat in a distillery was Masataka Takatsuru in Longmorn Distillery in 1919, because he'd come from a background in sake brewing, where hygiene was a, a different level entirely to what we um, in the whiskey industry, we were, you know, workmen in, in overalls and, you know, big tacky boots, as we would say. That wasn't how the Japanese were making sake. They knew about hygiene. They knew about bugs. They knew they had to be really clean. So when uh, Masataka Tatsuru went to visit a distillery, he wore an ankle length white lab coat because he thought hygiene was important, you know, in the maltings and places like that. Um, that's that, in my opinion, if somebody can find an earlier picture of men in white coats in a distillery, I'll throw that challenge out there. So I think actually Masataka Taka's uh, visit to Hazelburn and the conversations it must have engendered with Peter Mackey, I think there's a dotted line between then. I don't know the actual date that, that uh, uh, Hasty was recruited, but he then appeared at Hazelburn, set up a lovely lab. There's a lovely picture of it in a 1922 journal. I don't know if you've seen that or not. I can send it if you're interested. And they were carrying experiments. And I think there was a bit of catalysis went on after Masataka Takatsuru's visit, which was, what was that Japanese guy asking all those scientific questions about that we couldn't answer? That's a hypothesis. Did your grandfather mention Takatsuru at all later on? My grandfather died long before I was born. He died quite a young man. He'd had a bad war uh, in the trenches, some appalling experiences and conditions that he'd suffered in uh, effectively the Somme, you know, you know the, the trenches in France, um, and was very, very fortunate uh, to survive, but it damaged his health. So he died at the uh, young age of uh, 50, so long before I was born. Within the family, there were stories about uh, Hazelburn, about the scientific work that had been done. And there was, there was certainly um, some uh, small uh, mementos, uh, which I, I didn't realize the significance of the time, but little presents that had obviously come from Japan. But at that time, I didn't realize the, the connection. I, I later, when I sort of, so I didn't get a kind of narrative through the family, but we, we knew about my grandfather having been in Hazelburn, blah, blah, blah. Effectively, um, over the past 10 years, I've, I've been researching and I found out more and more about the story. You know, one of, one of the key things was, I don't know if you know this book, Olive Checkland. Okay, so that started me off and he got, he got Peter Innes, my grandfather, got name checked two or three times in it. And that set me off on trying to find out a little bit more I did um, question the, the kind of last remaining um, person I could in my family, who was my uncle, Peter, who was into his, in his 90s about 10 years ago. And I talked to him about it. And he, he had a clear memory of the visits, uh, of perhaps not so much the first one, um, but the subsequent visits that were made in 25 when Masataka brought a sample of Yamazaki uh, new make to be tested by my grandfather, and also when he um, came back in, I think it was 31, with the heir to the, the Tory the company. And by that time, I think, as you mentioned before, his thoughts were turning towards setting up his own company. I don't know even whether, the, was this some sort of a reach out mission to, by the, the heir to, of Suntory to Scotland to try and build bridges? I don't know. Um, I think there's more to that visit than is in the public uh, arena um, as well. And uh, again, probably the answer is in the Diageo archives. Everything we need to know about Scotch whiskey is in the Diageo archives somewhere. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it's, um, 
it's uh, it's uh, it's a matter of regret to me that a lot of the history tends to come out tends to be to build brands rather than to really uh, examine what the true history is. And there are some very good good um, objective uh, historical works, but um, you know it would be different if it was held in public archives and the um, the facts could be examined objectively rather than only the ones which are serving the um, the glory and interests of any particular brand. And for that, I think we should give some credit to Nika for at least republishing the original notebook in Japanese, which led you and Ruth on this journey. Indeed. To make it possible very... to do this translation because that was held in their private archives and it's still in their yeah. private archives. Yes, I was very fortunate back in uh, 2018 to be a guest of Suntory to go out to Japan and visit their distilleries. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if you've come across their former blender, Dr. Inatomi. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, but um, he, he and I had been working together on, on, a, on a project and he uh, um, encouraged me to go out to Japan as a, as a guest of Suntory. Uh, but they said, they said while they were there, and this, and as we know, the the, the, the Japanese companies are competitors. There's, there's, there's been no denying there's been less working together than there has been in Scotland, uh, perhaps amongst the companies. Um, although I think that's improving, and that's that's good as well, um, with, with certain of the developments of of associations and regulations, etc. But the Santori um, uh, uh, senior guys, very senior guys, uh, said you, you cannot come to Japan as the grandson of Peter Ness and not visit Yuichi. So they actually arranged for me to visit Yuichi, which was very, very good of them. And I was able to wander around and uh, naturally I took more than a, um, a passing interest in their museum because some of the artifacts in it were, 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 were items that Masataka Takatsuru had taken from Scotland, including things like his copy of Nettleton, you know, his, his original drawings, um, books of Robert Burns, all sorts of things like that, which, um, you know, you, you could see that he was, uh, he was very much um, engaged with not just the science of making whiskey, but also the more, you know, philosophical aspects of, of, of making whiskey and, you know, it coming from a place and the way that, you um, uh, it, you know, it should be made or, rather than just being, you know, sort of uh, mass produced. But he also looked at other things in this notebook, too, things like the labor situation in Scotland and yes. <laughs> how to work within the Japanese industry. Uh, all sorts of fun things that uh, we didn't know about until this translation. Well, th th there are so many interesting aspects of this. I I have a I have a sneaky feeling that some of his views on industrial relations came from my grandfather too, which was, which could be broadly summarised as they're well off, the, the workers are well off, um, they don't probably know how well off they are, <laughs> they're damn lucky. That's paraphrasing a bit, but he was he was comparing and contrasting the the miners who basically he he recognised you know dirty filthy job, um, but at least didn't have to buy their own coal. Um, with the distillery workers who he thought had really a pretty good number, were well paid, didn't have to work too hard, but really knew their stuff and were, um, how should we put it, steeped in the industry. Um, you know, that they, they, were, they were not, um, and, and also that they, I think he, I think he could see that a, a good worker that had built up knowledge and was a good, um, a, a good operative would be valued. And I, I think that, and, they, and I think he he felt back in Japan, it, it was maybe a little bit more kind of, um, you know, uh, master wage slave relationship generally, which he didn't approve of. So I think he was quite liberal and forward thinking in his views. Is there anything that surprised you when you read the translation? Ooh, Other than um, your grandfather not getting mentioned quite enough. Oh no no! I I I seriously I I I was glad he got a, a a name check. But when I saw the way the book was developing, it wasn't that sort of a of a, a report. It wasn't you know he was he was laying no. So I, I, the, there's no kind of the, I was a being facetious. A slight regret, but no criticism. What was it that there were two or three things that did surprise me? 
Um, you know, well, there, there was those little nuggets. Like he just said, there's another no notebook somewhere, and I don't know if Nick has got it or if it disappeared with set your shoes over about grain distilling. I would love to see that um, if it exists. I don't know if it exists, um, but he he makes a throwaway line about uh, um, his um, time at Bowness and and Gart Loch. And the fact that they were using backset, he talks about the production of yeast, and there was there was there was something. So the stuff in there also about grain distilling. Um, I think uh, I'm trying to think just quickly. It surprises me that he was he was thinking on various levels. You think about the science. He was thinking about how you could recreate this with few resources in Japan. He was also thinking about aesthetics as well. He talks about photographs that he took and with difficulty inside buildings but outside and he talks about photographs of you know children playing in streams and things like that which shows that he, i think he had a very artistic bent as well masataka takatsuru's on the production methods of pot still whiskey is available now through most online and local booksellers and a quick check on the status of j a nettleton's the manufacturer of whiskey and plain spirit shows it's not currently available in physical form, though it is available to download as an e-book. It does turn up occasionally at whiskey auctions, though, with winning bids around 200 bucks or so. Thanks to Alan Wollstenholm for spending some time with us on WhiskeyCast In-Depth. It's brought to you by Oban. Every sip of Oban is like a postcard from Scotland. Whether it's the classic Oban 14-year-old, the 18-year-old, Oban Little Bay, or the Distiller's Edition, every drop comes from the coastal town of Oban and a distillery just 206 steps away from the sea. It's one of Scotland's smallest distilleries, with just seven people who make whiskey the same way their predecessors have since 1794. Find out more at obanwhiskey.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with the Canadian Whiskey of the Year, Crown Royal's Noble Collection Winter Wheat. The sixth release in the Noble Collection series is made from 51% wheat, 39% corn, and 10% rye, and it's bottled at 45% ABV. The nose has notes of cooked bananas, nuts, vanilla, and toasted oak. The taste starts off buttery smooth at first, followed by a nice burst of baking spices, along with butterscotch, toffee, and a hint of oak. The finish, long and gentle, with subtle spices and dried fruits. Overall, there is an excellent complexity and balance here. I'm scoring the Crown Royal Noble Collection Winter Wheat a 94. There is an even newer release from Crown Royal, one of its oldest releases, though, in many years. The Crown Royal 18-year-old is bottled at 43% ABV. The nose has subtle touches of maple and oak, balanced by vanilla, brown sugar, honey, and dried fruits. The taste is elegant and well-balanced with touches of caramel candy, toffee, soft oak, peaches, apricots, and just a hint of spice. The finish is long, elegant, and well-balanced, and I'm scoring the Crown Royal 18-year-old a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They're reviving the tradition of Maryland-style rye at their Baltimore farm and waterfront distillery. In-person tastings are available once again at the distillery in Baltimore, but you'll also find a variety of virtual tours, tastings, and other experiences at the Sagamore Spirit website. And when you buy a bottle at your local retailer, you can get a free virtual guided tasting. Visit sagamorespirit.com and use the code WHISKEYCAST, all one word, to access. Please drink responsibly. The Whiskey Exchange recently released a 25-year-old single-cask bottling from the long-closed Imperial Distillery in Speyside. It's now the home to the Dalminac Distillery. 
This whiskey was distilled in 1995 and bottled at 50.1% ABV. The nose is malty, dry, and dusty, with hints of lemon zest, toasted caramel, and honey. The taste is fruity and floral with touches of citrus fruits, peach nectar, dried flowers, and subtle spices in the background, complemented by hints of barley sugar and toasted caramel. The finish, long and fruity, with hints of dried flowers, spices, and oak. I'm scoring the Whiskey Exchange's Imperial 25-year-old single cask bottling a 93. And while Imperial Distillery is long gone, Toraveg Distillery on the Isle of Skye is relatively new. So new that Alt Glen is only its second release ever. The single malt is part of Toraveg's Legacy series and bottled at 46% ABV. The nose is smoky and briny with hints of smoked salmon, a nice maltiness and a hint of black tea with lemon. The taste is thick and oily with good touches of lemon pepper and allspice, along with smoked salmon, barley sugar, and just a hint of honey in the background, and just a kiss of smoke to boot. The finish is long, tart, and slightly smoky, and I'm scoring the Toraveg Alt Glen a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 3,200 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. There are three whiskeys in the Doer's Double Double series to explore. Take, for example, our 21-year, an absolute must-try for any whiskey drinker. Our master blender puts this whiskey through a unique four-stage aging process, a testament to the care and craftsmanship required to make such a fine whiskey. Aged for a minimum of 21 years, this scotch whiskey is then double-aged and finished in first-fill Oloroso sherry casks. Dark red in color with fruit intertwined with honey on the palate, all packaged in a bottle that is sure to impress. Mark and the good folks of the Whiskey Cast team awarded this whiskey an impressive 94 point rating, along with an excellent tag when they tasted it back in 2019. Since then, Dewar's Double Double 21 year hasn't stopped racking up awards and accolades. Double Double 21 is a limited release offering from Dewar's, so you'll need to stay on the lookout. Also, keep an eye out for our Double Double 27 year finished in rare Palo Cortado casks and a 32 year finished in Pedro Jimenez casks, a whiskey that took home Whiskey of the Year at the 2020 International Whiskey competition. Dewar's Double Double. It's a great way to kick off 2022. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Scarabus Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Gang, there's a lot of misinformation out there in the world of whiskey. This tweet from Ask Rye Not is proof that not everyone who works in a liquor store knows what they're talking about. Quoting now, chatty worker at a liquor store asked me if I knew Willet was owned by Trace, a.k.a. Buffalo Trace, said I did not know that, and that the older Willets are part of Antique Collection. They also own Stitzel Weller, which is where Pappy and Weller are made. Oy. Oh, God, there are so many things that are so wrong in that one tweet. I just wish Scott, the guy who tweeted this, had told us which liquor store this person works at so we would all know where not to shop. Gang, you have my blessing to correct misinformation like this before it spreads, because this nonsense can spread as quickly as some viruses do. I went to the doctor's office the other day. Let's be honest, I had one of those milestone birthdays this week, that come with certain medical procedures as a bonus. So the physician's assistant asked me during the screening if I use tobacco. Never. Drink alcohol. Oh, brother. Well, since I was drinking coffee out of a Jack Daniels coffee mug, that should have been pretty obvious. So I went through the ritual explanation It's sort of what I do for a living. I do very small pours, all of that stuff. But after I tweeted that, 
I learned a line that I'm going to start using. It was shared by our friend Janet Patton of the Lexington Herald Leader, who shared this on Twitter. I usually say, I only drink at work. Of course, I work from home. So, what's your excuse? Share it with us this week on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, and I'll pass along some of the best lines next time around. If there's anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can do that too. Just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Scarabus, the Isla single malt from Hunter Lang & Company that celebrates all of Isla's natural gifts in one bottle. Only those who seek shall find Scarabus. Start your search at hunterlang.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and people who make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. We're used to seeing distilleries run seven days a week to meet the global demand for whiskey these days, but it was not always that way. In fact, it was downright illegal in Scotland for more than a century. Not because the churches didn't want distilling on Sundays, but because the law specifically banned distilleries from mashing and distilling at the same time. That led to a typical schedule of three days of mashing, three days of distilling, and a day off on Sunday before repeating the entire schedule. And with excise officers on site at every distillery to keep a much closer eye on things, there was no way to work around that law. The law was changed after the end of World War II, allowing distillers to expand production to meet growing demand. Of course, that expanded production also led to more tax revenue for the British government. That wouldn't have had anything at all to do with it, right? No. If you have something you'd like to see us look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. The tears of Ireland's great writers bursting with flavour, humour and angst. Bottled for you to taste. No writers were harmed in the making of this premium Irish whiskey. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes that dates all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like an Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Just like the end of this Whiskey Cast episode, Dewar's Double Double always makes for a smooth finish. Keep an eye out for a bottle of Double Double 21 year, and here's to a very happy new year. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2022, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, Please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.